Hello, and welcome again to our study of the book of Ephesians. You'll remember the last time we were together, we began to look at well, the first sentence in the, in the entire book, but we noted that that sentence is 14 verses long uh, in the English translations, which is very interesting, and, and maybe at first seems confusing, and yet look, it's really uh, elaborating on one major point. Uh, Paul begins the idea of spiritual blessings are in Christ. And we already noted, in Christ is a favorite expression of Paul's. Uh, <clears throat> it occurs about 169 times in all of his writings. In this book alone, it is over 30 uh, references that use that expression. He explained to us that uh, we are God's adopted sons and therefore we are accepted. Uh, we're, not, we're not cast off, we're not surprises to God. He longs for us, He loves us, He gave His Son so that He could adopt us. We talked about redemption. Notice uh, verse 7 says it is in the blood or through the blood of Jesus. So the truth is sin cannot be escaped without blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, and now Paul tells us it's the blood of Christ that brings about this redemption. Very, very important for us to see because Jesus left that blood in His death, John 19, 31 to 35, and we only get to His death through baptism. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 11, and Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Uh, then we saw that Paul talked about how God made all this known in the fullness of times. And we noticed that that basically is when the time was ripe. And we talked about various things that might have made up the time being ripe. I mean, after all, it was the days of the Roman kings. That's what Daniel had prophesied, or excuse me, had talked about in his prophecy as he interpreted the dream of uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. And so that's also a part of this, but when the time was ready. And ultimately, the goal of all this is so that we can have an inheritance, that inheritance being in heaven. And that's what we look forward to. We want to study a little bit further, so please stay tuned. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. All right, let's go back just a little bit and look at verse 11 because I want to notice how that Paul uses uh, some pronouns here. <clears throat> I think it's very, very important. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Uh, it looks like in the book of Ephesians that Paul may be using the word we to talk about we Jews. You know, after all, Paul was a Jewish convert himself. He's in Christ. There's no doubt about that. If you read this whole book, that's the emphasis of the book. But he's a Jew who is now in Christ. Now, as we get to verse 13, where we finished out the last time, uh, we find in him you also trusted. So now we go from we to you. And if I'm right about the we in verse 11 being the Jews, then in verse 13, the you would seem to be the Gentiles. And the Gentiles also trusted in Jesus. Uh, and that's very, very important that we all should trust in Him. Because remember, it's in Him that we have redemption, as we saw in verse 7 of this first chapter. So he says, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Now, we need to recognize that hearing is the Word of God is the means of producing faith. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 17. 
And that faith is absolutely essential to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So believing in God or having faith in God involves two things. First, believing that He is, believing He exists. And second, uh, believing that He will reward those who watch it again, who diligently seek Him, uh, who are involved in seeking Him. Boy, if you look at Hebrews 11, diligent seeking is always active seeking. It's always doing things. Uh, it's not that we do things to earn salvation. No, it's that we do things to demonstrate our faith. And that's very, very critical in understanding this passage. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you believe. Now, we've seen that if you really believe in him, you are active. You're, you're, you're doing the things that he tells you to do. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And it's interesting that, that the uh, tense that he uses here suggests that this sealing was a one-time act in the past. Now, if I understand that correctly, that probably is the same thing that Peter referred to in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that when you repent and you're baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's where you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And, and a seal in those days was a guarantee. If, if someone sent a message, if a king sent a message, for example, to the soldiers who were serving under him, to a general or someone like that, uh, he would write it out on parchment or someone might write it for him. And, and when he's finished, he would then uh, cause it to be rolled up. They would drip hot wax on, on the place where the paper came together. And this would be what it would hold it. And then while the wax was still uh, soft, uh, because it was still, had just, just been hot, he would press his ring down into it. And that ring was like his signature saying, this is from me. Well, guess what? Uh, what Paul says is that God, when we obeyed the gospel, well, gave us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a seal uh, that we are from Him, that we belong to Him. And thus, we're back to that idea of being in the beloved, uh, being the adopted sons of God. It's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful concept that we're looking at. And so verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 1 wraps up this opening sentence when he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Now, anybody that's ever sold a house or maybe a, a car uh, on their own may have insisted that if, if you're committing to buy this, you've got to give me earnest money. And uh, I remember in, in a bu house buying that if I said, well, you know, how much do we need to give them? A hundred dollars? They just laugh. They say a hundred dollars. I mean, anybody could walk away from a hundred dollars. Give them something meaningful. Uh, give them a $5,000 uh, earnest money check. And boy, when you do that, uh, you're not going to walk away from that easily. You're not going to give that up easily. Well, God has, has given us the, the seal of, of, of His Holy Spirit. And when He did that, He is guaranteeing, like earnest money, guaranteeing that ultimately uh, we will have an inheritance uh, because of our redemption as the purchased possession of God. And uh, uh, I, again, we, we really want to stress the importance of this inheritance. You know, Peter wrote his first epistle. And as he opened up in verses 3 and 4, he talked about how that we, that, that we have an inheritance, a living hope is, is that to which we look forward. And so uh, there is a, there's this redemption. Now, this is interesting. 
uh, because he's already said we're redeemed through the blood of Jesus. Uh, that is redemption from past sins. And so, for example, in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See, that's salvation from what's in the past. Then there is salvation in the present tense. Uh, <clears throat> And, and that's the saved of, of now, the saved of right here, right now. And so Paul writes to the sanctified in Christ. Well, that's a present tense. They're there. But then there's the ultimate redemption, the ultimate salvation. And that's in heaven. That's when we finally, in the day of judgment here, enter in good and faithful servant into the joys of my kingdom. And so uh, the Spirit is given to us to constantly remind us that we, are, we belong to God and that we have an inheritance that we will receive when we die as a faithful child of God and God blesses us with that marvelous gift. Not a gift that we earned, but a gift that He gives to us because we have truly actively believed in Him. Now he goes on in verse 15 of Ephesians 1 and says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul was a great prayer. There is no doubt about that. You read a, an epistle of Paul and you are likely to run into several references to prayer. And very often he does just what he's doing here. He says, uh, you want know, to hear about your faith, about your remaining faithful in, in Christ. And I know what that's going to lead to. That's going to lead to you receiving the inheritance that he's just talked about, the ultimate redemption. He says, when I heard about that, he said, I gave thanks. And he said, I don't, I don't cease to give thanks. It's a it's a constant with me. I'm giving thanks all the time uh, because, because of you, uh, because of your faith and because of your love for the saints. I thank God. And it's a repeated thing. And I, I mention you specifically in my prayers. And boy, wouldn't you like to see Paul's prayer list? I mean, if we just took the New Testament and wrote down everybody that we know that he prayed for, it is a long prayer list. I don't think he gave any uh, 30-second prayers. Uh, I, I believe most of the time he, he had a rather lengthy prayer because of all the people he was thinking about. So verse uh, 17, he tells us a part of what he asked for in his prayers for the Ephesian church, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I want you to grow even more in, in knowing what the Spirit is revealing about God, in being able to know all about God. I want that to grow in you. And I think the reason probably that Paul has that approach to things is he knows that the more we know about God, the more dedicated we'll be to Him. And so he prays for them that very thing. I mean, look, he spent at least two years and three months in that city preaching the gospel. He wants them to go to heaven. And so he wants them to grow in knowledge. He wants them to, to know ever more about God. So he goes on, verse 18, "...the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints." I love that expression, your eyes of understanding being enlightened. I, I'm reminded a little bit of my dad who, uh, who would talk about geometry and how that when he first went into geometry class, he didn't understand it. And he worked and he worked and he worked and for days and days he didn't understand it. And then he said, one day the light came on and suddenly geometry was easy because he understood it then. Well. Uh, Paul is doing, dealing with something much, much more important than geometry. He, he is saying, I, I want your eyes to be fully enlightened. I want the light to come on in your lives so that you may know what is the hope of His calling. You know, hope is what 
keeps us focused uh, on, on that end thing. You ever, uh, I'm amazed sometimes at, at these uh, double elimination tournaments that have a consolation game. Have you ever, you ever noticed that some of, some of the teams that play in those games kind of play lackadaisically? It's like, well, we're not in the championship game. Uh, we're not going to win this, this whole thing. And, and they just seem to give up. And sometimes they're beaten by, like a drum by a team that, that they ought to at least have been competitive with. Paul does not want the, the saints in Ephesus to give up. He wants them to remember their hope. And that's what he's praying for, that they would, that they would have that and realize the riches of his glory uh, that are found in, his in, in the inheritance of the saints, that the ultimate hope is heaven and having all the beautiful riches and blessings and all the honor that he has planned for us there. So verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? He wants them not only to know about the hope of heaven, he wants them to know about God's power. And as long as they remain faithful, as long as they remain true to God, then they can be assured that that power is working to their advantage. It's working to help them, to lift them up. And that's, that's a marvelous idea. Which he worked, verse 20, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. You see, I can be assured, you can be assured, that we have a great hope and that God is on our side. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. It, made him, it set him apart. You know, there are a lot of religious leaders that you can look at in history. Some of them are, are cult-like figures. They have many, sometimes millions of people who are following them, maybe even in one case billions of people who are following them, but, but I want you to think about this. Name one other significant religious figure who led an entire group of people, whether for a year or two years or even for hundreds of years, name just one that survived death. You can't do it. I can't either. That figure doesn't exist except in the form of Jesus Christ. His resurrection from the dead declared undeniably that he was the Son of God. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, uh, that, that he was raised from the dead, and that proved who he was. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, that's the whole argument of Peter and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost that God raised him up and made him Lord and Christ. And, you know, who could deny that? It was evident uh, because they were his witnesses and, and they could demonstrate it. So you and I have, have a marvelous reassurance that God is on our side, that he's working for us. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, uh, he, he just simply says, If God be for us, who can be against us? That's verse 31. And then he goes on and he talks about who's going to bring a charge against you? I mean, really, Christ is the one that justified us. Oh, we're going to stand blameless before God, not because of our own, our own sinlessness, but instead because of the sinlessness that is created in our lives by, guess what? The blood of Jesus. What we already talked about earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. And so Paul, you know, eventually in that 8th chapter of Romans, he goes through a, a whole list of things, things that, that people would think are powerful and ungetoverable, undefeatable, if you would. And as he goes through all of those, what does he say? He says, we're more than conquerors through the one that loved us. Though those things cannot defeat us. They never will. And that's what he's praying for for these brethren at Ephesus, that they will realize God's on your side 
And as long as you remain faithful in Christ, as long as the redemption is working in your life, you can be confident. I love that. It's beautiful. But then he goes on in uh, verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. When was God's power most on display? It was when Jesus conquered the grave. And there, there, it is the undeniable fact of Christianity. We can sustain that Jesus lived. There's no doubt about it. We can sustain the argument that those people who loved him were discouraged, they were downtrodden, they were disheartened, they scattered to the four winds after he died and they buried him in the tomb. They didn't have any hope. But then we can also undeniably set forth that they, that they came out of that hopelessness and into hope and there's really only one reasonable explanation to that. It's the one that Peter gave on Pentecost. It's the one they give all throughout the book of Acts. God raised up Jesus. And that give, gave them hope. And, and so Paul says that God worked His mighty power in the resurrection of Jesus. Here's, here's the point. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes it clear. God raised up Jesus. He can raise us up too. We have confidence in the resurrection of Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4. We can be assured that the dead in Christ will be raised as well. That's very, very important. That's what he's stressing here. So Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And, and how could you describe that place? Well, Paul does it. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Now, I want you to go all the way back to our introduction. And I want you to remember what folks that followed Diana or Artemis, that false goddess, what kind of names did they use for her? Didn't they call her Lord? Didn't they call her Savior? Didn't they call her queen of the skies, all those names. I told you we'd be coming back to that. Now listen to this, because Paul says Jesus is now seated in, the, in heaven, and guess what? He's far above all principalities, all powers, all people in authority, and above every name. Now, that's interesting. He didn't have to say Artemis, did he? I think Christians in Ephesus would have gotten it. He's above Artemis. You don't have to worry about that. But why is that? It's because he made him sit at his right hand in the heavenlies. Now, it's interesting that that, that word, way back in verse 20 that we read just a few moments ago, that that word is the same word that is, that is actually mentioned in verse 3 that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, Jesus is in the heavenly places. And so certainly our hope is there and our, our realization that, we are, that we're going to receive all these blessings is there. But now we see that Jesus is seated in the heavenlies. And so we begin to think, now wait a minute, we're, the church is Christ's body. We're just about to see that. And as such, our head sits in heaven. So there's a sense of the word in which we, through our head, Jesus, are in the heavenly places. And even here on earth, we could say that we are the, in the vestibule of heaven. That we, we are in the, the lobby, the foyer, if you would, of heaven. And what a beautiful thought that that is. What a glorious idea. So Jesus is seated at God's right hand. And, and notice now what God did when He sat, down, sat Him down at His right hand. Verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 1. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. All right. There's a couple of things we want to notice here. We want to talk about his authority. Uh, notice 
uh, in verse 22 that he says he put, put all things under his feet. Now, that is uh, uh, an interesting way to put that. Uh, all things under his feet. I'm going to use a capital letter because we're talking about the feet of Jesus. All things are placed under the feet of Jesus. Now, think about this just a minute. As you think about being put under the feet of Jesus, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we don't yet see all things under his feet. You see, death for you and me, is not yet put under, under Jesus' feet. There's coming a day when the body of Christ will be raised and then everything will be under the feet of Jesus, under His authority. But the point is that He has total authority. And He talked about that in Matthew chapter 28 when He says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. That's verse 18. So He is the authority in the church. There is no other. We can't vote on things we just got to find out what he wants and we've got to do it. And, and thus he goes on to say he is, the, he is the head. He's the head of what? He's the head of the, the body. But it is interesting that here he says the body equals the church. Now that's going to be important to us. Because when we get on down to chapter 4, we're going to see that there is, that there is one body. There's only one body. Now, if there's only one body, what do we conclude over here? There can only be one church. That's the reality of it. Jesus is not a sideshow freak with one head and multiple bodies, multiple churches. When I was growing up, they used to have an, uh, an ad, a public service ad, most often ran on Saturday evening as you were watching TV. And it would say, tomorrow is Sunday. Attend the church of your choice. Well, my answer to that today would be, no, I can't attend the church of my choice. I've got to attend the church of which Jesus is the head. Now, how am I going to recognize that church? Look for the one that's following His will in the Word of God. That's the only way that I'm going to find that place. So He is the head of the, of the body, uh, the church. And that, uh, uh, or the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. So we got a beautiful idea here as Paul uh, ends up that long opening verse in which he talks about redemption, redemption through the blood of Jesus. He rolls right into a thankful prayer, a prayer for the Ephesian church that they would grow in knowledge, that they... Because of that, hopefully they're going to get stronger. They're going to remain faithful. Their inheritance is going to be guaranteed. And what an inheritance it is because Jesus is not underneath any name. No, Artemis is not over him. Nobody else is over him. Instead, he's seated at the right hand of God. Everything is under him. He's the head of the church, which is his body. There's only one body, as we see in Ephesians chapter uh, 4. And He's the head of that body. We ought to yield to Him in everything that we do. Now, we're going to have to see how that we transferred from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of Christ. Lord willing, we'll do that next time. He hideth my life in the depths of His love And covers me there with His hand And covers me there with His hand